Good morning, everybody. So I want to talk to you about evolutionary architecture. And I don't have to define architecture here. But one of the things that we often hear is that architecture is that stuff that's hard to change. And unfortunately, that is not feasible anymore. We can't have anything that you really can't change in a software system. I want to spend a little time making sure you understand why you should care. But mostly, I want to talk about some of the principles that underlie evolutionary architecture, some techniques that help us establish an evolutionary architecture, and then talk about some of the evolutionary characteristics of different software architectures. So first, why should you care? We're good at requirements change. We actually have kind of figured this out, agile software development, all of this, and we understand that business requirements change. But what happens when the ecosystem changes? How many of you are willing to bet me $100 that you can tell me what JavaScript framework you'll be using in two years' time? Didn't think so. We don't know. We have so much churn in our technology landscape. And not only that, we've got regulatory churn, and we've got expectation churn in a way that we never really have had before. It used to be, as an organization, you got to tell your employees, you have to use this system. Anybody who's ever worked with some of the old travel systems, the keyboard machinations you have to go through to get anything to happen. Employees won't accept that anymore. Your customers, your external customers, expect to be able to interact with your system in whatever way they choose. So we've got this entire ecosystem that's turning around us. And so in this case, how can we do long-term planning? I had a reporter ask me, tell me what the technology landscape is going to look like in 10 years. I just laughed at him. <laughs> how in the world? It's just over 10 years that the iPhone was introduced. That's how much change we've gone over in just 10 years. And yet when I started in this business, five and 10 year architecture roadmaps were standard. They put this wonderful block diagram up on the wall, and it was going to stay there for five, six, seven, 10 years. How can we do long-term planning now in this era of constant change? How can we maintain stability? How can we actually have a stable system? Because one part of architecture that's still true, it is that foundation. It's how we think about putting the systems together. It's the expectations we all have. But with the environment around us changing so rapidly, how do we maintain the equilibrium? I love this picture. There's only one thing on this guy's mind, not falling to the, to the sidewalk. He is trying to juggle all of these different competing requirements on a unicycle, and that's kind of the jobs that we have now. We also, as architects, we love our LEDs. But how do you know when your system is out in the wild, that those illities are being maintained. How do I actually know that my system continues to exhibit the architectural characteristics that I want it to? So those are all the questions. And I will propose to you that this technique called evolutionary architecture is what is going to help us get through this. So anytime you come up with a new term, you have to define it. And it's very difficult sometimes to define these terms. But an evolutionary architecture supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. And I want to talk about each one of those three. The most important is frozen. <laughs> OK, let's go. OK. An evolutionary architecture supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. Guided is the first important word in this. I've been talking about evolutionary architecture for several years, as has um, Neil Ford. And the first time I heard him speak, he actually called it emergent architecture. And we had a very robust discussion about why I thought that was a really bad name. Emergent design, I'm fine with. We all probably agree, for the most part, what constitutes good code. 
When we talk about emergent design, we talk about how it is we're going to modify our code to introduce new functionality into it. But we're all pretty well agreed about what good code should look like. Yes, it varies across paradigms, and we can get into arguments on it, you know, variable naming and such, but pretty much we're going to agree. What constitutes a good architecture, though, that's different. What constitutes a good architecture for a sandwich ordering system is very different than something that has to protect healthcare data. One of the first systems I worked on for ThoughtWorks was a trading system. Now, I say trading system, you all think high throughput, low latency. In their wildest dreams, this organization figured they would do maybe 100, maybe 200 trades a day. Not an hour, not a minute, a day. But each one of those trades, even in the early 2000s, was worth billions of dollars. They didn't care about latency. They cared about never, ever losing a message. So our focus from an architectural perspective was on the communications infrastructure. How did we keep data flowing through the system? How did we ensure consistency across the three data centers on three different continents? One with an unreliable communication link. So what constitutes a good architecture varies. And that's why we talk about guided. We're drawing this idea from evolutionary computation. In evolutionary computation, we have something called a fitness function, and that's our definition of good. And I want to give you an example here. Earlier in my career, um, as they said, I worked in genetic algorithms. And I was at a conference, and they were presenting a paper on an airplane wing that had been designed by a genetic algorithm. And the fitness function was the aerodynamic um, characteristics. And the immediate initial response from the engineers was, your program has a bug in it, because it came up with this wild and wacky configuration. But they ran the equations, and yes, it had superior aer aerodynamic characteristics. It wasn't necessarily going to be easy to manufacture. It wasn't clear that it would fly for very long, but it met that fitness function. So this story should also help you understand we have to think about what it is that we are trying to achieve with these fitness functions. Because what we are talking about in evolutionary architectures, we are going to guide the changes in these architectures in our systems to match those fitness functions. So an architectural fitness function characterizes how close a system is to its desired architectural characteristics. We want to think about how a system should look. What are the important architectural characteristics? What are the things that are going to drive the decisions that we make about design and architecture? In that trading system, I didn't have to think about performance. I needed to think about communication. In others, it's security of the data, or maybe it's reliability or maybe it's mean time to recovery. Depending on the system, depending on the organization, depending on the application, what constitutes good is different. I worked with a uh, retailer in the UK once. They had a very interesting prime architectural driver. Every time we would show them a sample architecture. But what happens if we lose Scotland? They had about a decade previously had a freak communications failure, and all of their sto stores in Scotland were inaccessible to the mothership for about three days. And so every architecture that they did from then on had to be able to withstand losing Scotland. And so we ended up with this bizarre centralized, decentralized architecture just so they could withstand losing Scotland. For that organization, that was a significant requirement. The organizational memory was so strong that they could never conceive of an architecture that didn't have this level of decentralization so they could lose Scotland. So their architectural fitness functions would look very different than probably anybody else's in this room. I doubt any of you really worry too much about losing Scotland. <laughs> 
So what about fitness functions? This is not some magical thing. We've been using fitness functions all along. We just haven't really had a name for them, haven't really had a way to talk about it. We've got different types of fitness functions. Atomic versus holistic. One of the important things that architects have to deal with is trade-offs. We're constantly having to balance these things. A holistic fitness function helps you capture how, for this particular system, you want to think about those trade-offs. A, a holistic fitness function looks at multiple architectural characteristics at the same time versus atomic, which looks at only one. Static versus dynamic. Pretty obvious what that is. Triggered versus continuous. Is this a fitness function that gets triggered on an event, like perhaps a build, or does it run all the time, like a performance monitor in production? Manual versus automated. We'd love for them all to be automated. Some of them you probably can't. But the single most important characteristic of a fitness function is that you and I will always agree on the answer. We can't have fitness functions like maintainable, because you and I could actually disagree on how maintainable a particular piece of code is. Maybe we want to talk instead about limiting cyclomatic complexity or limiting some other software metric. We can agree on that. We can argue about maintainable. Temporal. The value of this fitness function changes over time. For example, you might want to say every project can be no more than 90 days out of date with any of its major frameworks. So a new version of the framework is available. Your build continues to pass for 89 days. And then on the 90th day, the build fails because you haven't upgraded. I have a question mark after domain specific because domain specific fitness functions are more like requirements. But we've given this talk several times in, to various audiences, and everybody always asks, is there such a thing as a domain-specific fitness function, and where can I download them for my domain? They don't really exist. <laughs> Maybe you could make an argument that in certain regulated industries, you might have certain kinds of infrastructure requirements that are driven by the regulations, but that's really stretching the analogy. So I said that these are nothing unusual. Here's some examples. You might want to say, I won't have any cyclic dependencies in my code base. And so you write a fitness function that does static code an al analysis and fails the build if there's a cyclic dependency. Caching versus staleness. You might have to put in a, a caching system for performance, but you might then have to balance that if you don't want to keep stale data around for security purposes, looking at those two things together. Chaos Monkey, the classic, holistic, continuous fitness function. This thing runs and just breaks things. But the nice thing is, anyone who is in any kind of architectural governance role at Netflix never has to worry about misconfigured REST endpoints because they get kicked out. All of the things that you can automate as fitness functions that you used to have to do through code reviews or through other kinds of architectural guidelines, that frees up the time of the architect to actually use their brain, to think about the hard problems, to think about, OK, how do I solve my performance problem without violating my staleness requirements? How can I change? the performance of the system, how can I change the caching? You can think about the hard problems rather than having these very expensive resources doing things that a static analyzer could check or doing something that a chaos monkey could check. Part of what we're doing here is providing a governance mechanism that doesn't require the heavy weight thou shalt from person to person. In some ways, Yes, it is, a, it is a bit more heavyweight. Neil tells a story about a place that, that he worked where they instituted a limit of cycl on cyclomatic complexity of 50. And some bright little uh, newbie had to do something 
that differed for every state in the union. So we had a 51, because of Puerto Rico, a 51 <laughs> if statement. And of course, it blew the limit. That's when that particular developer learned about uh, the strategy design pattern. But the point is, you didn't have to do that through a code review. You didn't have to wade through all of the different code that that guy wrote. You just rely on the automated mechanism. So these fitness functions are actually also a form of governance. Okay, so that's guided. These fitness functions, this development of the fitness functions is an architectural decision that should be made early in your, de in your design process, early in your development cycle, and then revisited over time. Second is incremental change. And there are two aspects to this. There's kind of the more how do we make it work and how do we think about it from an application perspective. So one very simple example. Let's say I have a star rating service that only uses whole stars. And now I want to allow fractional stars. So I deploy the new star rating service. But I don't make anybody use it. Over time, people start to use the new service. I'm monitoring not just the services themselves, but the routes. And then when the monitoring finds out that nobody is using the old service anymore, it just gets dissolved away from the application architecture. So that's one aspect of an incremental change. We can use monitoring and we can use a fitness function that says, hey, if over this period of time nobody ever uses that service, take it out of my ecosystem. When we think about this from an operations perspective, how would you actually make these things work? And this is where deployment pipelines come in. And I will assert that much like microservices and some other innovations that we've seen, evolutionary architecture really would not be possible without continuous delivery, without the rigor and the automation that comes along with continuous delivery. This would just be too hard to do. So you think of the deployment pipeline and the build pipeline. And let's say you want to automate some security checks. Well, you give your security department a stage in the pipeline. And maybe they normally do some simple testing. Maybe it's automated pen testing or something. But then a zero-day exploit comes out. Your security team can then drop something in that says, if this team is using this version of this framework, failed their build. And trigger a build across all of the projects. And now you will at least know where you're exposed. This would have saved a certain credit score company a lot of trouble if they would have had this. Third, across multiple dimensions, we're not talking about any particular aspect of architecture. We're talking about how architecture impacts all of the illities. And in fact, what we are asserting is that there needs to be a new illity. We need this to be evolvability. Now, naming is important. I've been asked many different times, why evolutionary architecture? Why not adaptable? Why not agile, something like that? I want to talk specifically about adaptable. Because in general, when people hear the word adaptable, they think, OK, there's some kind of configuration parameter, or there's some throttle or knob that I can turn because I've anticipated where the change is going to come from. And I've built the infrastructure to ensure that I can respond to that change. The problem is you cannot predict where that change is going to come from. And if you have tried and you get it wrong, what have you done? You have more code that's harder to understand, that has more bugs, because more code always has more bugs. And you've probably made it harder on yourself to make the change that you actually have to make to respond to what actually happened, not what you thought was going to happen. So don't try to predict the future. Think instead about having your system be evolvable, which means it is as easy as possible to make whatever change is necessary based on the circumstances.
Don't try to anticipate it because you're probably going to get it wrong. So what are some principles? Last I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn, but last responsible moment. Think specifically about evolvability. We need to talk about how we communicate. I'm from ThoughtWorks. We have to talk about testing. And then Conway's law. You cannot have a conversation with more than three architects and not have Conway's law come up in the first 15 minutes. Last responsible moment. One of the things that we want to think about in this context is when we make decisions. We want to delay particularly critical decisions as long as possible. Our fitness functions, what we actually care about, help us to identify what that moment is. But what we want to make sure that we do is we have as much information available to us as possible when we're making these critical um, architectural decisions. Architect and develop for evolvability. Think about what will make a system easy to change, a system that is easy to understand. Make sure you have clear, well-defined boundaries. In particular, try to make sure your boundaries correspond to things that the business actually thinks about. Whatever business you're in, there are clear, defined concepts that are talked about all the time. The closer the model of your system is to corresponding to what the business actually looks like, the more likely you're going to be able to move the pieces around in your systems the same way the requirements are moved around in the head of the people who are giving you, you the requirements. And develop for evolvability. This means we need to care about software quality. I'm not saying that we need to stop all production releases until we fix all our technical debt. I would love to say that, but I'm too much of a pragmatist. But we do have to think about how easy our systems are to understand, and a lot of that comes down to code quality. If you cannot understand the code that's there, how you, can you change it? Postel's law. Be as forgiving as possible in what you receive, because that's going to make it less likely that you are going to have to change. We can't make it impossible. We can't completely protect you. But all you need is the zip code. Don't validate the address, asterisk. Make sure you pay attention to security stuff and buffer overflow and all of that. But don't validate something that you don't need. Because if they decide to change the format of the address line and all you care about is the zip code, then you're going to have to make a change when you wouldn't have had to. Architect for testability. What we have found, in fact, is that if you think about how difficult something is to test, you end up with very clean boundaries. If your test names start to say this and this and this and this and this, you probably don't have a cohesive conceptual unit. If you can't describe it, then you probably got too much stuff in there. This also picks up things like putting too much logic in middleware and all of those other things, because none of those things are very easy to test. And Conway's Law. One way I end up looking very bright when I go to our clients is I just watch how the people interact. And if the, if the leads from two different departments don't talk to each other, I can almost guarantee that that integration is broken. It's amazing the number of times I've gotten that right by just watching how people behave in the lunchroom or how they behave when they cross in the hall. If the people don't communicate, the systems aren't going to communicate very well either. So we need to think about how we're aligning our teams around the functionality so that we have the right kind of communication. So how do I do this? There are lots of different techniques. I've already highlighted continuous delivery. I want to call out three specific ones here. Database refactoring. I will assert that of all of the different roles and all of the different complaints I've heard over the years about, no, we can't do Agile, the DBAs probably had the best excuse because data migration is hard. It's conceptually easy. I've got data in this format. I want to copy it over to this format. It's never that simple. 
What database refactoring does is it allows us to simplify as much as possible data migration. Much like with continuous integration, where you've got small changes, and so it's very easy to identify what broke because you haven't made many changes, that's what database refactoring does for migrations. You decompose large-scale database changes into very small refactorings, and you compose them. And each one of those small refactorings comes along with the migration required to make it happen. And so you can find out which part of the database change is tripping up against this magic field that between August 14th of 1977 and February 4th of 1978, that magic field, why that isn't working very well. You can find that out. This idea, this book called Database Refactoring, or excuse me, Refactoring Databases, I believe is the single most significant unappreciated book since the year 2000. Um, ironically, Neil and I have actually been talking to promote uh, a colleague of ours who's one of the authors. They should republish it, but flip the title and the subtitle, because the subtitle of this book is Evolutionary Database Design. And with how everybody's now talking about evolutionary architecture, maybe it would give the book new life. Choreography is, is a second technique. Yes, this does introduce all kinds of additional complications in how you coordinate, but the more you can distribute logic, the fewer places are impacted by any change that you need to make. So from an evolutionary perspective, from your ability to change, choreography is superior to orchestration. And then contract testing. This is a way that you can allow teams to run relatively independent until they have to talk to each other. I have a contract with James. James and I merrily go off and develop until the test that James gave me breaks. Now I have to go talk to him. And we sort out our differences. And of course, since nobody else's test broke, I don't have to talk to them. I just have to talk to James. And then once we resolve our differences, he and I cheerfully go back and ignore each other again. We can't stop you from actually having to have those conversations, but we can make sure that they only have to happen and we know specifically why they have to happen and what problem we need to solve. And I can keep the concerns I have for James's system independent of all the other concerns that people have. So these are just some of the techniques that you can use to make an evolutionary architecture. So let's talk a little bit about the evolutionary characteristics of different software architectures. Big surprise, the big ball of mud is not very evolvable <laughs> on any dimension that you can think of. But a structured monolith is actually not bad. When you think of it from the footprint of deployment, you still have a monolith, you're still doing deployment of the whole monolith. If you want to do any kind of scaling, you have to scale it as a monolith. But if you have a well-structured monolith, the relationship between the internal components are probably not going to be more difficult to evolve than they would if it was in something like a microservices architecture. You don't have as much flexibility with your technology choices because you're in a monolith. But again, if it's well structured, you have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can move that system forward. What about a layered monolith? For years, we've all loved our layers. We have our data layer, we have our presentation layer, we have all of these abstractions so that I can swap out my database. How often do we really swap out our databases? But that's beside the point. But if you think about it, you have one dimension of evolvability that's blindingly obvious to you, your technology choices and your interfaces at those different levels. But everything else requires probably a change that goes through all of those layers. If you need to suddenly introduce additional security mechanisms, you're going to do it through all of the different layers. 
So you have one dimension of evolvability, but it's very technology focused. On all of your other characteristics, you're probably touching most of those layers. And you probably, and, and you still have the deployment monolith and the scaling monolith. So it, it's better for certain kinds of changes. But actually, I would assert not really the kind of changes we're likely to be making now. What about a microkernel architecture? In certain circumstances, the microkernel ar architecture makes it very easy to introduce changes. If you've got something that needs to be specialized by state or country, that microkernel architecture is a good one. But there's a problem here. Let's go back to what I was talking about earlier. To some extent, a selection of a microkernel architecture means you are anticipating some kind of variability. Now, maybe it's blindingly obvious to you. If you have to deal across multiple jurisdictions, it probably makes sense to do some kind of microkernel architecture to allow you to vary with those jurisdictions. But that doesn't mean any of the other things that are actually in the core are any more evolvable. So you have, again, a dimension of evolvability based on that, those adapters. But what about the rest of the system? You still need to consider what are the evolutionary characteristics that you want within that core component. Microservices, again, conference bingo. Um, but this actually exhibits many different dimensions of evolvability. Some of the people who talk about microservices, uh, one talk I heard, he actually forbid anybody to use the same technology that someone else had used in another microservice. Absolutely forbid it because he didn't want any accidental sharing to happen. Now, I think that's a tad extreme, uh, but it might be a good way to get a point across. Microservices give you the technology flexibility, the deployment flexibility. Um, you can still get it wrong. Just like with the structured monolith, you need to think about where am I going to draw those boundaries. So you still have the possibility within those microservices of not having a system that is as easy to change as you want. Some other people will view microservices as something that it's small enough so that I can just throw it away. Well, in some ways, that's the ultimate in evolvability. You have, you have no history if you can just throw it away. But the microservices do exhibit significant levels of evolvability across multiple dimensions simply by their nature. That doesn't mean you need to always use them. OK, so how do I actually do this? How do I get started? Most of us in this room are not in a position where we've got a green field to play with. It's kind of obvious how you do this in a green field. You start by deciding what your architectural drivers are. And then you put in all of these fitness functions so that you know whether or not you're meeting the architectural characteristics that you want. But most of us are dealing with legacy. So how do I do this? You still want to start with a fitness function. You still want to think about what are the critical architectural characteristics. You've got probably more evidence. I, I like to go talk to the operations people and, and say, when do you get nervous? When are you most nervous when you start to hear about a change that's getting ready to go to production? That's going to tell you of a source of vulnerability. And that's going to help you start to think about, OK, this is clearly an architectural characteristic that I'm not meeting yet. So start out, define your fitness function. And then go off and find whatever dimension you're most worried about. Notice, I did not say which one was most likely to change. You can't know that. But where do you feel most exposed to change? It might be that you're worried about the rumblings you hear in your legislature about some new regulation 
and what impact that's going to have. It might be that you're worried about a competitor eating your lunch because you can't get UI changes out fast enough. There is going to be some number of things that you're most worried about in, in the system. And that's where you should start. Start improving on that dimension. Characterize what your goal is and start monitoring it and start thinking about what are the changes that I can make to bring my system closer to compliance. Some of, that, some of them might be low-hanging fruit. I'm going to go on a quest to get rid of all cyclic dependencies, and I'm going to establish patterns of acceptable cross-references between different layers. And I'm going to you know, make, make this temporal fitness function. All teams have to have all of those things out of their build because as of January 2nd, your build's going to fail if you've got a cyclic dependency in there. I don't know. There are going to be things that worry you. Put in a fitness function and start improving on it. Chances are at the beginning you're not going to want to fail a build because you're probably far off from where you want to be. If you happen to have a characteristic that you're meeting that, maybe you do want to fail the build if it breaks so that you know someone somewhere has just made a decision that has degraded one of the architectural characteristics I care about. An important part of this, though, is to focus on what matters most within the context of your organization. Because we all know legacy systems have all kinds of things that we could fix in them. There may be integrations that you don't like. There are all kinds of things, but keep focused. By having this language of the fitness functions, we can start to talk about what are the things that are most important. We can start to talk about how we want to trade these things off. We, want to t we can talk about what we want to focus on. And that's part of the power of standardizing this language, is to allow us to put all of these different things on a level playing field. And then monitor how things are going, adapt, and repeat. Just like architectures continue to change over time, your architectural fitness functions should change. You want to reevaluate those fitness functions. Has the environment changed in such a way that my performance requirements are maybe more stringent than they were? Always look at those fitness functions. That should be part of an architectural governance process, is a review are these fitness functions still what I want? Are they still appropriate for my business? We also want to use these, as I said, for governance. This is going to help us think about and manage our systems in the wild. One of the clients that we work with were very impressed. We showed up, and they had a spreadsheet of all of their different architectural re requirements. Said, great. You've articulated them. If I come back in three months, how are you going to convince me that your system actually meets these? And so we started to talk about how would you actually turn those different architectural requirements into a fitness function? As I said, for a fitness function, the important requirement is simply that we agree on whether it passes or not. This might be a performance monitor. It might be a static code analyzer. But we want them to be objective. We want to agree. And then, as an architect, when you're dealing with teams, you don't have to sit there and think, are they doing the right thing? Are they respecting the architecture? Are they worrying about the things I want them to worry about? You don't have to think that, because you can go to them and say, show me your build. Show me that your fitness functions are all passing. And again, it's a trigger for a conversation. If I'm trying to do something that bumps up against one of these fitness functions, I can go and say, look, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. Mr. Chief Architect, help me solve it. Because I can't right now do what I have to do. 
And you can use all of that expensive brain power to solve the problem instead of sit through and try to make sure that nobody is, is uh, entering a, a, a poorly configured REST endpoint, for example. So these are the mechanics. It sounds easy, but the big part of it is having that initial conversation. What architectural characteristics do you care about the most? We call this evolutionary architecture because of the central nature of this fitness function. It helps us say this is what constitutes good in this organization for this application in my domain. Thank you very much. Questions? I volunteered to ask the stupid question. Okay. So um, <laughs> on your slide, uh, going through the steps, define architecture fitness functions, select a dimension most exposed to change, start improving. I didn't understand why I was starting with the fitness function and not the dimension of concern. Because the fitness function conversation is where you look holistically at what, what are the illities that I care about, what are the ones I don't care about? So it, it, it sets the context. And then you want to say, okay, so across all of those things that I care about, where do I feel my system right now is, is most exposed? Maybe not furthest away, but most exposed. But you want to have the overall context first. Okay, so I'm going to define S multiple fitness functions Correct. and then from those decide, okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. The, the, the way you think about it, these individual fitness functions collectively make up a system-wide fitness function. You'll probably never execute the full system-wide, it's more, more of a conceptual, but you want to know for the overall system what are those various fitness functions, you want to know what they are, you want to know how you're going to test them, and then you're going to, then you're going to focus in on what you care about. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There was one over there, too. Hi, you said um, architect for testability, which is, I love that idea. Can you maybe expound on that? Like maybe the best question is how? What's the better, best way to do that or good ways to architect for testability? When you're thinking about any particular decision, think about how would I test this? So if it's an integration point, how am I going to know the integration is correct? Um, is, if it's, if it's um, some other kind of functional decomposition, how would I test the individual little c components that, that I've decided in, in my decomposition? Uh, what, what would it take to test that? And ironically, naming the test is also a big part of that. If you can't think of a good name because there's just too much stuff going on, then there's probably too much stuff going on. Or you haven't really thought enough about what, what holds that component together where the cohesion is. Thank you, that was a great talk. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I was reading about fitness functions is they're really the architectural constraints, the invariants mm -hmm. you want to maintain. Um, there's quite a lot of architectural constraints. I might find it quite difficult to write an automated test for that would run quickly. Do you think it's still valuable to write those down, even if you can't test them quickly through an automated mechanism, or would you yes. just leave those to another approach? No, I, I think it's still important to, to write them down because if we want to think about this fr from a governance perspective, we want to be able to agree yes or no, does this pass? If we don't have some unambiguous definition of what constitutes passing, you can't know that I'm, that, that I'm following that constraint, that I'm respecting that constraint. So even if you can't test it automatically, um, or it takes a long time to test, by making it explicit 
it makes the communication around that constraint much clearer. And, and it, it also then all, does allow for the conversations. If I, have to, if I feel like I have to violate that constraint because of something I'm trying to do, I know that that means I have to come talk to you because you're very explicit about the constraint, I understand the constraint, and we need to work together to figure out is, is this something that has an exception or do we work together to figure out another clever way of solving the problem? I guess I have the uh, mic so I can ask a okay. question next. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you were talking about architecting f and developing for evolvability, mm -hmm. and you mentioned making sure your boundaries correspond to uh, what the business looks like. Mm -hmm. Does that mean domain-driven design in your mind? Um, I would say a small case domain-driven design, um, but conceptually, yes, that's what we're talking about. Um, there are some domains that, that, that doing, you know, big D domain-driven dr design is just is, is too much for, for the domain, but every, every system has, has these essential concepts in there some way, and so if you can identify what those are, your system is going to be more likely to change because the kinds of things that the users of the system are thinking about that's, they're going to put it together in their conceptual model. I think that's, that's part of how we went so wrong with the first instance of service-oriented architectures, as we were thinking about it from the, perspective, from the perspective of the systems, not of the concepts. Right, so uh, like, a, like a really heavy focus on maybe the ubiquitous language and mm -hmm. making sure we're modeling the uh, entities that are meaningful to the yes. business users. Yes, that, that, that is one thing that tends to help make the system easier to change in the way that you're going to be asked to change it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, very great presentation, thank you. Um, how would you approach an organization where this level of transparency about the state of the organization, the state of a project, is perceived as threatening? How do you... <laughs> How do you uh, start changing such? One of the things that I have found is by putting it on this objective basis, it becomes less about my opinion of what constitutes good um, and more of here's an objective assessment based on industry metrics or based on a collective understanding of this is what we want. Um, the nice thing about this, and this is why trends are so important to, to, to monitor, if you're in a massive remediation effort, one of the big questions is first, are you just doing this because you don't like it? And that's what being objective helps. But then how do I know we're not going to fall back into the old patterns? How do I know that in two years' time I'm not going to have to go back and do another remediation effort? And that's where keeping these trends in there and responding to, to, to them uh, makes a difference. But I, I have found that making it objective rather than subjective diffuses those conversations, uh, that feeling like they're under attack. Um, I don't know why. But it does, seem to, it does seem to happen that way. I have a question about fit, fitness functions. Sometimes a system is set with constraints where it'll, say, make an alert if mm -hmm. something goes out of bounds. Yes. And the reason for that is not only to see the fitness of the system, but also to catch if anything unusual has changed, maybe something just to catch mm -hmm. something recent change has just done something unexpected. Mm -hmm. But that's a different kind of catching than seeing whether your system's architecture is continuing to meet the requirements. How do you separate those kinds of metrics that you're, uh, and constraints that you're measuring to see if the system has a, a, a temporary flaw or is um, long-term continuing to meet your architectural objectives? I, I don't consider them quite as different as you do. 
Um, because fundamentally, okay, it may be that the architecture is, is effectively sound, but if it is available, if it is able to expose that anomaly given something happened to, happening in the environment, it is in fact violating a constraint I set for it. Now, it may be that we don't care about it because it's a freak, freak event, um, and it may be that we don't fundamentally change anything in the system, but I still consider that a fitness function because we said, okay, memory, memory utilization should not go above this threshold and because of something not, not within your control, it goes out of bounds, I still want to know about it and I still want to know why. It may be that it doesn't cause me to change my system, but I don't actually see those as different. Uh, at one point you talked about uh, choreography versus orchestration. Mm -hmm. I think the orchestration metaphor is pretty familiar um, if you've worked with services, but can you talk about what choreography looks like? Oh, sorry. Um, so th th think about a dance performance. You know, under orchestration, you have a conductor and he's standing up there. In a dance performance, each performer gets the vision from the choreographer. They know how they're supposed to interact. They know what they're trying to achieve. But they have individual decision making. Because if I'm supposed to leap and have somebody catch me and he falls over before I've leapt, I probably don't want to leap. But I still know what it is that we're trying to achieve and maybe it's important that I be over there anyway and so I just don't leap, I do something hopefully graceful. Um, it's the individual decision making. So how that plays out in systems is you, each one of the individual actors, components, services, whatever you want to call your executable entities, they know how they're supposed to interact. And they also know kind of what to do when things go wrong because they know, that they know effectively what they have to achieve. And if something goes wrong, they, they at least they know internally, this is the state I want to leave myself in. So that's, that's the distinction. Okay? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention.